Okay, I'd like to start off by asking you your name, when and where you were born. My name is William Howard Hodges. I was born on April the 18th, 1929, in a family farmhouse uh, located uh, between Hickory and Great Bridge uh, in Norfolk County. And what about your parents? Who, what were their names, and where and, and when were they born, if you remember? Yes. Uh, my father was John Arthur Hodges. He was born in the same farmhouse as, as uh, his second son. And uh, he uh, was born on September 17th. 1902, and uh, uh, what was the other inquiry? And your mother. Oh, and my mother's name was Leela Old, O-L-D, and she was born on February the 14th, uh, 1901, no, 1902, and uh, she was, uh, her place of birth was uh, in a little area in Norfolk County. Uh, again, it was a farm, but uh, it, uh, I guess would, you'd say it was in Fentress, which is a little farm settlement uh, in Chesapeake. No more farm settlement because it's uh, uh, just a group of uh, housing developments. And so how did your parents meet? Well, they sort of grew up together. They were in school together. Uh, and uh, when I uh, uh, got to the point uh, that my father had to drop out of high school and uh, ran the, uh, at his father's death, and he ran the farming operation, and uh, he uh, uh, and my mother, my father was uh, uh, dating a lady uh, down in the uh, lower uh, part of Princess Anne County. Uh, and uh, he had been down to visit with her one night, and he was uh, on his way back to his residence and apparently fell asleep, ran into a train, of all things, out near where the Ford plant was located, and uh, uh, luckily he wasn't seriously injured, but he had some injuries. And my mother was living in a boarding house in what uh, later became South Norfolk. And uh, she came over, having known him, and uh, nursed him along in his recuperation. and. Uh, uh, that's where the romance started blooming, and not too long after it, uh, he had the chains around his neck, like all other men. And so when did they get married? They got married on, let's see, They were both 18 years of age uh, when they got married, and it was September the 2nd, 1920, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And they were married uh, until uh, August and September of uh, 19, 
75. They, were, they died, uh, my father first, and my mother uh, passed away exactly 30 days to the day uh, after my father. Well, uh, yeah, she had high blood pressure, some things like that. But uh, all of us uh, have agreed that she just grieved herself to death. They'd been married at that time, uh, what would it be? Uh, like six, yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, she uh, just never could uh, accept it. Mm -hmm. And uh, my brother and I tried to do things uh, for her that we thought would be of comfort and such, and uh, like getting her uh, to join friends for lunch, uh, participate in, in cards playing uh, and, and such. And uh, all she'd do is sit there around these other friends of hers and just uh, uh, ex, uh, well, she, she just would would cry and and such, and it was terribly hard on her friends and uh, equally as hard on my mother, and just she just gave up. That's uh, very sad. I, I was wondering, going back to uh, after your parents were married, um, when did they begin having children? Well. They'd been married, uh, they'd been married about nine years when I was born and about five years when my brother was born. And what was your brother's name? Herman Leon Hodges. And he hates Herman, <laughs> that name, to this day. And he'll be 90. Uh, in June. And does he live in, in the Hampton Roads area? Yes. Mm -hmm. In fact, he lives here. And his wife just passed away about two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Or less than that, about a week and a half. That's very sad. Well, when you and your brother were growing up, you were growing up on the farm. So what were some of the things you enjoyed doing? When he stopped beating me on me, <laughs> he, uh, he was four years older, and I wanted to do everything he did. And the thing about it, he didn't even want me to be on earth. <laughs> and, uh, but the funny thing like about it was uh, uh, he uh, would be doing something to me and somebody would try to intervene, and then he'd defend me. <laughs> uh, so typical that, sibling rivalry. Yeah, right. And um, uh, what kind of farming did your father do? Well, mostly truck farming. We first crop in the year was uh, were strawberries, and uh, then uh, uh, Irish potatoes, uh, and then uh, in the fall, uh, uh, summer and fall, would be uh, various things, butter beans and, and uh, uh, maypeas and things of that nature. And uh, we could get two crops in most of the time of follow up with uh, corn and soybeans. And so did your father employ seasonal workers to help him? Well, yeah, well, one, basically. But uh, 
truck crop and you have to have people to gather them in for you, pick the strawberries, and they were paid two cents a quart for picking them. And in potato digging, we paid them five cents a bag for picking the potatoes. And uh, that sounds like nothing today, but uh, wasn't all the profit then that they have today. And the success of the crops uh, varied from, of course, from year to year. And uh, that was a big consideration. And so when you were growing up, did you envision yourself as being a farmer and following in your father's footsteps? Me doing it? No, ma'am. I used to uh, ask him, I'd say, why do you make me do this? I'm not going to be a farmer when I grow up. He said, son, if you don't want to be a farmer, I hope you don't have to be a farmer, but you're going to know how. <laughs> so... And so when you were in school, what school did you attend? Uh, I attended uh, Great Bridge High School. Uh, well, all 11 grades at that time. We only had 11 grades. And then uh, after graduating from Great Bridge High School, my uh, mother and father concluded that uh, before going to college, it would be very advisable for me to have a little postgraduate course. And I ended up at Randolph-Macon Academy in Front Royal. And, and how long were you there? One year. And any time during that year, I could tell you the number of months, weeks, days, hours, and seconds I had until I got out. Why was that? <laughs> I didn't like the military of it, and I didn't like the first day I was there when I arrived, uh, a little old kid from uh, Pittsburgh uh, who didn't come up to my shoulders hardly, was sending me downtown to get some donuts for him, uh, and that was hard to, to uh, accept. And uh, I, I just didn't, didn't like it at all. Uh, was that the first time you were away from your family as well? Yes, yeah. Was that difficult for you? No, not, I like to be home, mm -hmm. but uh, no place like it. Uh, well, when you were in grade school through high school and even at Randolph-Macon, did you have a favorite subject? Uh, I did probably better on spelling than anything else. Really? Yeah. You like spelling? Yeah, but don't ask me now. Did you enjoy reading? I hate to say it, no. That's been my real weakness in education. As, uh, and I would just give anything in the world if I'd taken a course in speed reading I'm, I just poke along, and uh, it's, uh, it's hampered me a lot, uh, but... Uh, uh, Did you play sports? Well, I tr tried at, at, at Great Bridge at that time. We didn't have a gym, so we couldn't do much in basketball, and we didn't have a, a, really a football field. But we had a baseball diamond, and uh, I tried to pitch, but most of my pitching was in batting practice. <laughs> but I didn't have a very good record, but I liked baseball because that was by far my father's uh, favorite sport, and I liked to do what he ever, whatever he did, and. And uh, uh, for that reason, I developed that interest. And um, uh, what um, 
extracurricular activities did you and your family do growing up? Uh, did you attend a, a church? Did you have yeah. social groups that you uh, uh, well, met with? Yeah. My, uh, uh, the, the farm on which I grew up was uh, part of a grant from the Crown. And uh, I do not know this. I haven't seen the papers themselves, but I'm told that it was about 2,100 acres. And uh, uh, we, uh, uh, along the line, when uh, Bishop Asbury from the Methodist Church was sent over here by, uh, I think it was John Wesley, uh, to uh, expand the church in the United States. And that bishop came to this area. And his goal was to have a Methodist church within four miles of everybody. And uh, my family gave a, a small parson, parcel, I think at that time, and, and if I'm not uh, uh, incorrect, uh, the grants are, uh, are the holding and acreage uh, of a church can't exceed nine acres. Well, anyhow, uh, our family gave nine acres to the Methodist Church. And uh, we're, uh, there was a church located not too far from where I grew up. Uh, and uh, it uh, was in existence until uh, uh, about early 1930s uh, when the transportation improved and, and such. And they merged that church with Oak Grove Baptist Church. And uh, at Oak Grove, we had a, a services every Sunday where some of the smaller churches, even after merger, uh, had had it on uh, twice a month. And, uh, uh, but uh, my mother in particular uh, <clears throat> wanted to be at that church on Sunday morning. She wanted to be the first to arrive and the last to leave. And uh, she was a communion steward for a long, long time. Uh, and uh, uh, she was the children's superintendent of Sunday school for a long time. We were very active uh, in, in the church. And uh, my father was on the, they called them the board of stewards uh, back in those days. And there were 12 men. Uh, and uh, when they uh, uh, went to raise money for a project, they uh, <coughs> imposed on those 12 men as much as possible, and which was good. If they're going to run it uh, and be the leaders, uh, I think more is expected of them. And uh, then they would go out and uh, subscribe uh, from the other members of the, of the church. And it, that uh, was effective too, when they could refer back and say, the stewards have given uh, uh, X number of dollars and uh, uh, then they say they're, they're dependent on the remainder of you to do it and then there'd be a little back twisting with that. Who 
do you think growing up most influenced your life? Well, uh, I guess I had sort of un, uh, uh, unusual uh, situation. Uh, of course, my parents were a great influence, but in addition to the farming operation and my father being in uh, law enforcement, we had a little country store. And back in those days, they had a little store that kept a round cheese and uh, got bread in and eggs and things like that. Uh, and uh, we, we had that and <laughs> along with it, uh, came a bunch of old farmers who in the wintertime in particular would gather at that store and they'd elect people to office and grow crops and do that sitting there uh, chatting about this side or the other. And uh, uh, we had four gentlemen who were just uh, outstanding people. And it was to me like having four additional uh, grandfathers and they'd correct me right off the bat. If I did uh, something they liked, they'd commend me for it and, and uh, just had a nice, nice relation. And uh, they had a, a real influence on me. And then as a continued to grow up in school and such. I had teachers who uh, uh, have made a, a, I guess I can say, a contribution to trying to make something out of me. What, what motivated you to go to college? My mother and father. At the uh, time, uh, in their lives that uh, they could have gone to college. Uh, 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 finances were a big thing and uh, my uh, father had uh, two older brothers, half brothers, and they both went to William and Mary. Uh, and uh, by the time it got to him, uh, he'd, he'd already dropped out of what would have been the normal age. He'd already been required to drop out of uh, uh, high school. And uh, uh, I guess it wasn't a real consideration for him. And of course my mother, she was in a family of six children and there were three boys and three girls, and uh, uh, of that, uh, the three boys, only one went to college. And uh, as you might expect, the uh, men had the first choice of going to college because they were the bread earners in those days. and and. Uh, they had to be better prepared than uh, most others to, to go. So now you mentioned that your father had gone into law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So how did he make the transition from being a farmer to law enforcement? Can you tell well, that story? His, uh, he got into it through uh, Funny avenues, all right. Uh, the in the uh, mid thirties, uh, he faced some uh, substantial losses on the farm. Uh, between seven and eight hundred hogs died uh, from cholera, and. Uh, uh, 600, I mean, six horses 
died within one year. And uh, th it depleted uh, his finances and he had to have something to supplement that loss. And uh, he uh, looked into becoming a game warden, but uh, he missed out. The fellow who got the job was also involved in, in uh, uh, politics and light away. And uh, uh, my father, the only service he'd had politically was he was a justice of the peace. And uh, one thing uh, led to another where the politicos offered him a job as a police officer in the, on the county police force. And uh, he uh, took that job uh, and uh, 1938, I think it was. And uh, th th that uh, is where he f first got involved in the... Uh, in, in law, law enforcement. enforcement. Now, what was the police force like at that time? <laughs> it, it's hard to describe. You, and you'd hardly believe what it was like. Um, it, uh, for instance, when he took over sheriff in 1944, uh, they had 19 police officers, and uh, he, uh, my father was always neatly dressed and hated uniforms, so he didn't wear a uniform. Had one, but didn't wear it, except for uh, a particular occasion. But uh, they, he had some of those men on the, on the police force that would uh, uh, wear uniform trousers uh, tucked in rubber boots, those old short boots. And uh, they uh, would uh, wear uh, red hunter's shirts and uh, heavy suspenders, I remember that, uh, well, no two of them dressed alike, thank the Lord. <laughs> uh, but it was something to behold. So and, essentially they were untrained. Yeah, no training whatsoever. Uh, and so did your father, was he involved at all in helping to organize their um, operations? Yes. Mm -hmm. what, what, what did he do? Well, he... Uh, uh, at the time that uh, he took over, uh, a legislative uh, commission had been uh, created to investigate lawlessness in Norfolk County. And uh, they uh, came down as a part of their undertaking and uh, sat at the courthouse, which was uh, located in Portsmouth at that time. And uh, uh, 19 of police officers, 13 were under indictment in the circuit court. Uh, and uh, there were allegations of police officers being involved in prostitution, uh, different things that, that were illegal. And uh, uh, they held trials and not a single one of them were convicted because the judge appointed the police officers and, and uh, he wasn't gonna 
have his uh, appointees removed from office, so that's the way it went. And they uh, uh, had a proceedings in the legislature to uh, uh, impeach the judge, and it lacked by one vote in the Senate of uh, making that Im impeachment. And uh, so, uh, but an anyhow, they called all those police officers, 19 of them, in before that commission and uh, uh, had some right uh, strong allocations uh, answered. And uh, when they were through with their work, they uh, uh, assembled them again uh, to tell them uh, what the next steps and such were going to be. And as they were concluding, the uh, chairman of the uh, commission, who happened to be a Hodges from South Hill, Virginia, uh, asked the general question to the whole uh, group and it said, uh, gentlemen, we've uh, uh, propounded a number of questions to you during our, uh, the course of this investigation. And as we conclude, I'm sure that you might have some things on your mind and there wasn't much of a reaction to it. But my father stood up and uh, asked, uh, he was asked for what purpose he stood. And my father said, uh, I know that if y'all find that uh, any of us have done wrong, uh, you're going to uh, announce it to the community. And uh, my f he asked the, uh, a question of if you uh, do or don't find anything wrong, will you please let them know that? And uh, uh, so that uh, if that uh, those, I forget how exactly, but it, it was to uh, ask that uh, people who were innocent of anything to, to be uh, exposed and as well as those who had. Mm -hmm. So that kind of uh, sat well with the commission and uh, several times they called him in to investigate matters, things that uh, they had on their minds. And, and uh, he uh, uh, got along well, apparently, with the commission. And, and they praised him for it. And uh, uh, I think that really led to his becoming uh, a sheriff. It sounds as if your father had a a natural proclivity to politics? Yes, but my mother more so than he. Really? Yes. It, tell me how. Well, she was a campaigner. And uh, one of my father's closest friends was on the board of supervisors. Uh, that's, uh, and during most of that period was chairman. And uh, they worked together uh, very well and very friendly with the family. And during the war, a lot of people moved in, uh, not as many down in our area, which was entirely rural, as around the premises of Norfolk and, and Portsmouth. And, uh, uh, but they'd move in and if they needed some pipe for the driveway to the house they were building or, or whatever they needed that the government would would uh, know about. 
Everybody ran to Miss Leela, she was called, and uh, uh, she'd have it out there by four noon the next day. <laughs> and and uh, she just uh, got along fine with, with everybody. And uh, uh, she, she was a real influence. Uh, on one occasion, uh, uh, during the primary for Congress, my mother was supporting one candidate and my father another. <laughs> and mother's candidate won. <laughs> and we had the biggest time with the, over that. Well, it sounds like your parents were extraordinary influences on your life. Did they, did they have any uh, say in the college that you would later attend? Well, they would have, but we were Methodists, and uh, Randolph Macon came along, and, and uh, I've often said I think my mother's greatest desire for me was to be a Methodist preacher, and my father's was to be a professional baseball player. And I wasn't prepared for either. And so when did you uh, apply to Randolph-Macon? While I was at Randolph-Macon Academy. Yeah. And I almost decided against Randolph-Macon College while I was at Randolph-Macon Academy. But I went and... Uh, Why was that? It, uh, was a source of great enjoyment and uh, uh, much uh, to my surprise, uh, I was elected to the Board of Trustees of Randolph-Macon and served there for about 17 years, uh, which I thoroughly enjoyed. And uh, So what, what made you almost not apply to Randolph-Macon? Uh, it was my experience at Randolph Megan Academy. Uh, I had a, uh, I'll, I use the term disdain while I go. I had it for uh, military. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, I just didn't like that. And the fact that Randolph Megan College was not military was the one. And then I had a, couple of close friends that had gone there and they uh, liked it a lot. So that's really what took me there. So what did you major in when you went Sociology. to? Sociology. Why did you choose that field? Because I liked the professor. <laughs> and who was that? Uh, his name was John P. McConnell. And uh, he... Uh, and his wife had a small farm nearby, and uh, he'd uh, ask for volunteers occasionally to come out and help him with something. And uh, I was always jumping in, in the middle of the crowd and ready to go, uh, because I'd rather do that than study. And he he was a very practical sort of person and and uh, he liked for you to feed your own ideas and things not necessarily what some uh, previous fellow in uh, sociology might have done but what you think ought to be done and, and uh, uh, we just G'd and hard. Uh, he did most of the g and, <laughs> and I did a little bit of hawing. <laughs> At what point did you decide to go to law school? To law? Mm -hmm. Well, I had a very good friend at Randolph-Macon whose father was an attorney and uh, <clears throat> Suffolk, and uh, 
his, uh, he and his father really prevailed uh, upon me to, to go to try it. And what were their names, do you remember? What were their names, do you Well, remember? the father was Charles B. Godwin, and the, uh, my friend was James C. Godwin. And uh, uh, Charlie B., as he was known to all the children and people of Suffolk or Nansman County, uh, uh, was, I called him the Pied Piper of Suffolk because everywhere he went, he had a string of kids behind him and he was the biggest tease that ever lived. And, but the kids just loved him. I, I mean, and uh, uh, he, uh, and he had a, a lot of influence on, on what I did. Uh, and his uh, son was in law school, Jimmy Godman, and uh, it uh, turns out that our uh, lives crossed many, many times after uh, leaving Randolph-Macon. And uh, uh, they, uh, they told me I ought to try it. So I was in the Coast Guard at the time uh, during the Korean conflict. And uh, I uh, got married one week and went to law school and the next at the beginning of my first year. And uh, I uh, was astounded when I went there because uh, of my father being sheriff and my desire to be a state trooper, uh, I was interested in criminal law. Well, it turned out that of 90 hours uh, that of your classroom uh, that uh, only three hours was in criminal law. And uh, uh, I, I just, I, I was really disappointed with that. And, but anyhow, I stayed on and I was not a good student. For instance, when I went up on a Saturday morning and classes were still heard on Saturdays, I went up to talk to the dean about enrolling. And uh, we were talking hunting and fishing and, and the good things. And the bell rang time for him to, to go to class. And he said, Hodges said, said uh, I've enjoyed uh, chatting with you, but you know, we can't consider your application for admission uh, without your college transcript, and you'll have to send that to me. And I reached in my coat pocket and passed it to him. And uh, he sat back in his chair, threw his feet up on the desk with his spats showing, and uh, uh, started looking at it. And uh, he said, I just said, you didn't do too well your first two years in college, did you? And I said, regretfully, no, sir. And flipped it on the other side, said, didn't do too well your last two. <laughs> but he said, anyhow, we're going, we'll take you and we'll try you. So I got in and uh, I didn't do too well in, uh, in uh, law school because a fellow named Pat Collins, whose father was Lieutenant Governor of Virginia at the time, uh, and I would, he'd say uh, there were a hundred counties and cities at that time, and uh, he said, I'll beat you naming those hundred counties. And so 
lecture going on. We were sitting there doing this, that, and the other. <laughs> and uh, that was the reason I didn't do very well. Uh, but uh, I made it through. And I think the only thing that my brother had any respect for while I was in law school was the fact that I passed the bar before I graduated on schedule. So, How do you think you uh, were able to do that? Was that something that you were interested in? Well, we all had little um, areas in which we studied, and mine was uh, right near the reports on Virginia cases. And of course, the bar examiners take a lot of their questions from cases that have come up. And uh, luckily, I was able to, to make reference uh, to those cases in support of what I would do, or this and that and the other. And uh, it could, I, I was fortunate enough to name the name of some of the cases. And uh, I, I think that got me through. And because uh, I don't know what else it could be. What was your brother doing at the time you were in law school? My brother uh, was at uh, VPI. He likes to call it Virginia Tech now. Uh, and uh, he was in uh, accounting and uh, doing quite well with that. And he just couldn't understand why I'd have any problems in law school, you know. But uh, that's what uh, stunned him. But uh, he went on to uh, pass his uh, uh, the uh, test to be a uh, uh, CPA and uh, had been very, very successful uh, during his life uh, practicing in this area. Well, before we go on, I want to kind of go back a bit and ask you about your original goal to become a state trooper. What made you want to become a state trooper? Well, I had a, a uncle who was one of the first 50 state troopers. And uh, I just thought he was God <laughs> with that shiny white car and uh, uh, that uniform that was spick and span and pressed and such. Uh, and uh, then when my father became a police officer, I uh, enjoyed being with him uh, and was, I was with him a great deal of uh, the time that he spent there. And you also mentioned that, um, that you were in the Coast Guard during the Korean War. Uh, when did you, were you, were, did you have to enlist? Did you voluntarily enlist? I volunteered. And what year was that? That was 1951. And what made you choose the Coast Guard? Well, the, uh, one of my classmates at Randolph Megan, fraternity brother, his uncle was in Washington and was uh, uh, head of, the Department of Personnel for the Coast Guard, and uh, he was uh, very uh, effective in uh, getting a number of us uh, uh, signed up for uh, OCS. And uh, uh, I guess that had as much influence as anything else. Now, you said you were in a fraternity. What was the name? Phi Kappa Sigma. What made you join that fraternity? Well, because of the caliber of people they had and, and 
lot from Suffolk. Uh, well, I didn't know them, but they were close by. And, and uh, for instance, with uh, Jimmy Godwin, our lives have continued on uh, doing a lot of things uh, jointly uh, since uh, finishing college. And uh, he, uh, and I like to think I had a little something to do with it, became a judge uh, shortly after he uh, uh, finished law school. And it was my first year in the General Assembly. And uh, I was rooting for him and uh, he got elected. And uh, then we were in the uh, weddings. Uh, he, he was in, uh, married in a year or two after we finished college. And I was married about three years later. And uh, uh, we were in each other's weddings. And uh, then uh, we uh, were, <coughs> uh, he was elected judge first and had served for a good period of time be before I became a, a, a judge. Uh, but, uh, uh, we continued on uh, being close to each other, uh, being very, very, very close friends. Mm -hmm. Now, when you were in the Coast Guard, what did you do? I was in the Coast Guard Intelligence. And uh, the, at the time, at that time, uh, the Coast Guard had no training facilities or schools or whatever. And uh, uh, I went to uh, the Army uh, Criminal Investigation Division School, and uh, which was a, a top-notch uh, school, I thought. For instance, we had the <coughs> uh, Dean of a <laughs> a small college in, uh, I guess, southwestern United States. I don't know, it, it wasn't that far. It was Arkansas. And uh, uh, he uh, was in charge of report writing. We had, uh, 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 I'm trying to think of the family that developed the uh, Kodak uh, uh, photography. Uh, well, anyhow, he he taught photography, uh, and uh, the there was a attorney general who had been recalled. Uh, I, I forget the state he was from, but uh, he uh, taught the code of military justice and on down it was it was just really good and i thoroughly enjoyed it and that led me to the coast guard intelligence in fact it's right uh funny experience i had i went in on a got out of the school and Usually when you, the school was about four months, and usually when you conclude something like that, you get uh, a few days off. And, and it's always to report in on a Monday. And I went up and reported in, and uh, it, uh, uh, <coughs> um, I was sitting in the hall way in a chair, I'm not supposed to say hallway, uh, having been in the Coast Guard, but uh, I can't think of what it, the lingo they use for it. But anyhow, I was sitting out there waiting to go in and be 
told where I'd go, what I'd do, and and such. And uh, uh, the uh, district personnel office was raising holy hell about uh, the absence of his chief yeoman who ran the place. And it turned out he was in jail down in Princess Anne County. That uh, was a county seat of, of uh, Princess Anne County was uh, not too far over from where I lived. And uh, they uh, uh, finally out, went over and, and uh, uh, told the commander, who was a personnel officer, that uh, if he'd give me uh, uh, a few minutes and permission to use his phone, I thought I could get the, the uh, chief there. And so I got on the phone and called the sheriff down there, who I knew quite well, and told him what the problem was. He said, you know, it'd take me a half an hour to get him in there. I said, that'll be fine. So in about a half an hour, there came two uh, uh, <coughs> adeptus, uh clutching the arms of this man with handcuffs on. <laughs> and they came in and shoved a paper at me, said, uh, here's the gentleman you wanted, and uh, said, you'll have to sign a receipt for him. Well, I never signed a receipt for many things at that stage, particularly for a human being, but I did. And uh, I had the chief follow me on back and stood in the doorway to the uh, personnel officer's uh, office. And uh, I said, sir, I think this is the gentleman you wanted. Well, he let him have it, and he let him have it some more. And uh, he told me, he said, go have your seat, and I'll have you in in a minute. And the way he <laughs> got on that chief uh, for getting in jail, uh, I didn't know whether I wanted to be anywhere around or not. But anyhow, he uh, called me in and he asked me a question. He said, uh, where you want to go and what do you want to do? And I told him my interest in, in law enforcement. And uh, he said, well, uh, what about port security? I said, that sounds fine. And uh, he, he said, uh, uh, go have your seat and I'll see what we're going to do. So uh, he called me back in and he uh, verified the fact that I could be in port security. They'd have a job for me. And uh, I said uh, to him that I was aware that they had some of the men uh, in port security wore uh, uniforms. I didn't have to wear a uniform, and I'd like to be considered for that. And he said, my Lord, there are only two for the whole district. <laughs> said, let me find out where you go. Have a seat. He called me back in, and, in a, a minute or two, and held up three fingers, said, there are three now that don't have to wear a uniform. <laughs> Finish telling me where you want, want to go and what you want to do. So that's how I got into the intelligence. That's an interesting story. I'm surprised you didn't stay in the Coast Guard. No, uh, I, I just never have liked the the military that much. Mm -hmm. uh, I still wanted to be a state trooper while I was in the Coast Guard. But somehow you went to law school, you passed the bar before you finished law school. Um, and so what year did you finish law school? 
1956. And when did you get married? I got married in, uh, in, on August the 8th, 1953. And so, your wife, did she go with you when you were yeah. uh, in the Coast Guard? How did the, what did, well, let me back up. Tell me your wife's name and tell me how and perhaps when the two of you met. Well, regretfully, uh, probably one of the worst experiences of my life. I went through a divorce in 1989. Uh, we just liked a short time of having been married for 35 years. And uh, uh, we were married the whole time I was uh, in law school and in good time after, after that. And so tell me your wife's, your former wife's name. Oh, uh, her name was Ann Turnbull Harding. and. She was from Emporia, Virginia. And how did the two of you meet? How did the two of you meet? How did the children... No, how did the two of you meet? Oh, uh, we met on a blind date. Again, uh, uh, one of my close uh, friends in, in the uh, Coast Guard was a fraternity brother from Suffolk, and uh, he was dating a school teacher in Suffolk, and Ann was teaching in Suffolk. So uh, he uh, and Ann and the uh, young lady that uh, Henry Odom uh, was dating, uh, they were roommates at the teacherage. The city had a house in which they uh, could uh, provide uh, uh, accommodations to, to the teachers. Now the two of you met, you, you dated, married in 1953, and then a year later you had your first child? Yeah. And give me the names of your children and when All they right. were born. Uh, the name of the uh, first child was uh, Susan Harding Hodges. Uh, and uh, she was born on June the 24th of 1954. And uh, my second daughter was born on February the 18th of 1960. And what was your second daughter's name? Oh, she was Carol Ann Hodges. And what, um, did the two of them eventually go to college? Did they go to college? Yes. Uh, Susan graduated from uh, Longwood College, and Carol uh, graduated from, uh, um, oh, the schools in, in uh, Stanton, Mary Baldwin, yeah. She went to Randolph-Macon for two years and transferred to Mary Baldwin so she could get some additional math courses. And what area did they pursue after they graduated? What, what did they do after they graduated oh, college? Uh, well, S Susan taught school. She did several things. Uh, and uh, Carol went to work with uh, Bank of America. Uh, and uh, she worked there 25 years and retired. And uh, a short time after it, uh, the uh, Sun Trust Bank uh, hired her 
Uh, and Carol, uh, uh, not reluctant about the bank, but just uh, was reluctant about going back to work. But she went back, uh, went to work for SunTrust and has been there, I think, about nine or ten years now. And she's uh, uh, in uh, personal banking. And uh, she started that, started in it, at Bank of America at the outset. And she'd uh, had uh, right much experience with it when Trust, Sun Trust started their uh, program and uh, has done uh, very well with it. Now, let me go back to after you graduated from law school, you were now licensed to um, practice law in Virginia. Yeah. Where did you um, set up practice? I didn't actually set up. I went with an exi existing firm, and that was Kellum and Kellum, uh, uh, which was located here in Norfolk. And uh, uh, I, the only experience I had of practicing was with that firm. And what made you decide to go with them? Uh, I just, they were very, very friendly people. And while they were targets of, I guess, not the attorneys, but the family was a target of a lot of criticism, uh, but uh, to me, they were just uh, perfect gentlemen, and and I've got to know all of them, and to this day, I still have a high regard for them. And what did you um, specialize in? I guess more criminal law, and there's no money in that. Uh, I guess when you get to be big time, uh, but uh, generally speaking, uh, the, those uh, in that, that practice uh, a lot of criminal law uh, don't make the money that you do in civil uh, side. I did, uh, well, I guess you could say I had a general practice about as uh, in uh, the office, main office was in Norfolk, but uh, I practiced here in Norfolk for uh, about four years. And then when the courthouse in Norfolk County moved from Portsmouth to Great Bridge, I moved uh, to Great Bridge also. And how long did you stay in, uh, in, in practice with uh, Kellum and Kellum? Well, until uh, 1972, uh, when I went on the bench. Now, let me ask you this, because something happened in 1962. You decided to run for public office in the General Assembly. Why, why did you decide to do that? Well, I just, uh, I couldn't be a trooper. <laughs> so so I uh, went into law and uh, creating the law that uh, you have to abide by as an attorney. And all those things together, uh, uh, are interesting, and uh, it just sort of drew me in, too. Mm -hmm. What was your experience like in the General Assembly, in the House? Well, I think it was probably the most pleasant thing I've d done in public service. Explain what you mean. Explain what you mean. Well, the proudest moment of my life I think was when I stood on the floor of the 
House of Delegates and took the oath of office. Uh, and uh, that was something I never dreamed that I would uh, achieve. And uh, served two terms in the House and was uncontested in either election. But the story differed. Uh, friends of mine prevailed upon me to run up for the Senate. I was perfectly happy in the House, but uh, the Senate is a higher of the two houses of the uh, General Assembly. And uh, I think everybody has a, that serves in the House has a desire to be a senator. And so I, I ran for the Senate in 1955, and uh, it was a battle, uh, a real battle. Explain that. Well, uh, I was in a, in that my senatorial district in which I lived had been placed in a, a three-person district, and uh, uh, there were three senators, and uh, the, there was no requirement that they be from a certain political subdivision, uh, but just three elected, and I came out and I was running at the same time with, with uh, Bill Kellum from uh, Virginia, Be uh, from Virginia Beach and uh, Billy Spong was running at the same time. Well, Billy was reluctant to team up with us and uh, uh, he enjoyed a great popularity uh, in that three uh, city district. And, uh, but uh, and I went on and uh, uh, I was elected. And uh, then when it came up the next time, uh, two years later, uh, I uh, was uh, re-elected and I did, I led the ticket at that time among the three cities uh, and uh, that was a four-year term and then when I came up at the end of that six years, I ran again and uh, uh, very pleasantly uh, was reelected. And uh, before taking office, uh, we couldn't have any agreement on the election of a new judge. And somebody said, why in the world don't you take it? And uh, I said, you know, I can't because the Constitution provides that no member of the General Assembly can be elected to an office uh, by the, the uh, uh, General Assembly. And, uh, and uh, one of them spoke up and said, well, you know, that can be skirted around. And uh, uh, I said, well, I named a case where somebody in the Senate was elected to the State Corporation Commission uh, and uh, he had to be, uh, uh, had to step out of office because of, of the conflict and the, the Supreme Court upheld it. And so uh, anyhow, this person said, well, you know, the Attorney General uh, has written me uh, in answer to my inquiry and has said if 
you don't take office for your new term uh, that uh, you can be elected uh, as a judge. And so that led to that. And, uh, so you were interested in becoming a judge? Well, you know, I think every person who practices law is interested in becoming a judge. Why do you think that's the case? Well, you, you uh, uh, observe a case or, uh, or you participate in one. You, you uh, uh, wonder uh, what, what, what I've done, you ask yourself, to, under these facts and circumstances and things, questions of that, that nature. And uh, that's, uh, I guess, was my motivator. Uh, and so in what year did you become, and, and tell us what, what uh, position you held as a judge? Well, in 1972, I, I became the judge of the circuit court of Chesapeake. And uh, at that time, uh, in a circuit, uh, whatever, there was one judge. And uh, during uh, Governor Godwin's second term in office, uh, he created a commission to study the judiciary and to make a recommendations uh, back uh, to the Journal of Sumner, what changes of in it should make. And uh, one of them was to, uh, for instance, in, in Norfolk at that time, they had a corporation court. They had a corporation court part two. They had a circuit court, and they had a court of law in Chancery. Well, as a result of the commission study, they recommended that all of those courts be consolidated into what we now call the circuit court. And uh, uh, that applied uh, to all areas that had two or more judges. Those who didn't have an uh, uh, independent judge uh, or two, two or more uh, independent judges, uh, they put them in a, in a circuit. And uh, they, because there had been uh, uh, situations where uh, five uh, courts uh, were uh, governed by one judge. So now they increased some of them to where they had 10 actual courts uh, with two judges. And there were a number of reasons for that without having to go through the chief justice, they could, uh, where there was a conflict or something of that nature, uh, the judge, the, the second judge in that circuit could pick it up and uh, wouldn't have to get a designation and things of that part, nature, so. When you first became a judge, what was the most challenging task or case that you had? Well, uh, I wanted to rule correctly and uh, I uh, was uh, concerned, of course, about that, and uh, I uh, 
always uh, was concerned about the image of the court, that people uh, came there, uh, even though they might not uh, uh, prevail, that they felt satisfied that they'd uh, gotten treated fairly and, and that uh, they'd had the opportunity to be heard. And, and that's hard to do because uh, I've seen a lot of people go to court and prevail, but not seem satisfied. <laughs> and uh, it, it's uh, very difficult, but that's, they were my major concerns. Did you ever have a, a case that um, really perhaps bothered you uh, about the decision that you had to make or uh, what you had to hear in the case? Uh, now, you're... If, did you ever have a case that was difficult in, in terms of maybe what you had to, the decision that you had to make, you had to follow the law, obviously, or perhaps the content of the case was really um, troubling to you. Yeah, I had a lot of, a lot of them. Uh, if I understand what you, you're uh, asking again, I want to do what was uh, correct under the circumstances, the facts and the law, and uh, uh, I, I thought you were going to uh, ask if I had difficulty because of a personal relationship or uh, something of that nature. No, but uh, now that you're on the subject, did you have, because you knew a lot of the people who were there yeah. in the area. And, and so did you ever encounter a situation where you either had to oversee a case with people that you knew? Uh, yes. Uh, and uh, if I thought there was any conflict or, or it would uh, cast the impression that because uh, I knew them that I would rule uh, more likely rule for them or against them or whatever the nature would be. And I think uh, that was one of the real purposes uh, th that the uh, commission uh, to study the court system uh, was concerned about and the reason they, they uh, made uh, uh, the requirement that there be two judge, at least two judges in a circuit. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then you, you could just, uh, with the dinner, uh, formal, uh, ceremony or in it thing, uh, the judge could recuse himself and, uh, uh, or herself, I should say, uh, and uh, you should when, when there's any question about it. Did you ever, um, do you recall if any of your decisions were ever reversed by the higher courts? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, have any particular ones that you feel should not have been reversed? No, no. I think they uh, had a few cases that were matters of first impression, and if they hadn't been passed on in Virginia, they had been passed on in uh, some other court and reviewed by the uh, Supreme Court, uh, and uh, they... Uh, Supreme Court of Virginia was always pretty kind about those and pointed out 
that there uh, was a conflict uh, and that uh, some states had adopted a certain theory and another state uh, something else or whatever it was. And, and that uh, while they understood that that was a law in those states, they th thought the uh, more proper way to was something else, and and uh, uh, I had no uh, trouble with that at all, and uh, I think they they pretty well uh, convince uh, the attorneys and the judges that uh, when they reverse a case. Why it is being reversed, and most of the time it's being uh, reversed on the, because the presiding judge applied uh, law that uh, didn't support or apply to the situation at hand, or all kinds of reasons, and you know that's just the way they rule and what uh, what kind of caseload did you have when you were a judge on the circuit court well uh, they call uh, the circuit court a court that uh, uh, presides over uh, that a circuit court is a general jurisdiction court and it applies over uh, just about any kind of uh, case that there is to, that would come before the court. And uh, now they real often uh, change the, the uh, uh, or transfer cases from one circuit to another circuit uh, for some other reason, but uh, any kind of case uh, that covered by statute or whatever uh, can be uh, tried in the Virginia Circuit Courts. Now, how long were you uh, a judge in the Circuit Court? Well, I was there. Uh, about, yeah, about 13 years. And uh, then they created the Court of Appeals uh, and uh, I went on that court in, uh, on February the 5th of 1985, I think it was. And you were part of the group that had to form the rules of that court and its organization. Tell me about that experience. Well, uh, of course, none of us had, had uh, uh, any affiliation with the Court of Appeals. Uh, and uh, the legislation creating the court uh, limited the jurisdiction in some types of cases and they went uh, those types of cases that were eliminated went on to the Supreme Court directly uh, and uh, it was sometime hard and and uh, Deter determining whether the issue in a particular case should have gone to the Supreme Court or whether it should first be heard in, in the uh, Court of Appeals. Uh, and we had uh, uh, some concern at, about uh, the, whether application of the law went there. Uh, but uh, 
Well, you all had uh, um, some early, very early struggles with that court because the chief judge passed away uh, before things really got started. Yeah. Um, so can you tell me a little bit about that time period? And Yeah, uh, I think you're referring to the death of Ballard Baker. And uh, that was within, uh, I think, about four months of the time the court was uh, uh, being created. And uh, uh, we uh, ended up having to elect another chief judge to take his place. And uh, uh, that uh, uh, caused again some concern because there might have been some matter that we discussed and passed judgment on uh, that something else that we considered later on conflicted with that and we would have to go back and and Whereas if uh, there had been someone who'd been a, uh, uh, in charge from the beginning, we, we could avoid what was thought by some might, might be in conflict. Uh, but uh, all in all, I, th I think we've, we did a, a, a pretty decent job of, of putting it together. Were uh, there judges uh, on that particular court that you worked with constantly or more often than others? Well, in, here in Norfolk, uh, there were three judges in the area that uh, 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 probably worked together. I guess we were uh, closer in, by miles and in some instances f further by agreement <laughs> than uh, uh, other areas. And uh, but uh, we didn't, uh, uh, we had some on the court that were of liberal leanings and some of which I was a part that were pretty conservative. Uh, but. Uh, all in all, I, I think we did a decent uh, job, and and uh, I don't think uh, that that really was a, a uh, anyone that I, I worked uh, real close with. It was all a part of of. Uh, of trying to put it together and, and have a good uh, uh, working relationship and... and uh, what would you consider to be the most challenging part of serving on the Court of Appeals? Well, uh, We, uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, uh, <clears throat> well, the, again, uh, 
we had to adjust ourselves so that we weren't uh, going to try to reverse a judge and, and uh, force him to uh, uh, rule a certain way. That's not our function. The uh, function of the Court of Appeals was to review it and see if the uh, trial judge uh, made a, a mistake. And if it made a mistake, uh, w was it uh, uh, a reversible error to the point of that it uh, uh, kept the uh, litigants from receiving a, a, a fair trial. And uh, I think one of the real things is to uh, disregard the fact that the judge is wrong, uh, was it uh, uh, of such a, a, th a thrust that it did control the case? And, uh, and you know, whether the trial judge liked it or not, that's the law and it got to correct it. And uh, I was just reviewing, I'm still doing a little work for the Court of Appeals now. And, uh, and instead of, uh, of reviewing to determine uh, uh, whether the judge made a mistake, and again, if that mistake uh, was of the weight that it affected uh, the outcome of the case and uh, uh, deserved a, a new trial or whether the, uh, if it wasn't, that the case would just go on. But you can't tell the judge how they ought to rule on a certain uh, case. And that's not our function. Uh, what was the most enjoyable thing about being on the Court of Appeals? Well, you know, I hate to say this, uh, but I hesitated. I was a candidate for the Supreme Court before the Court of Appeals. I was a candidate on two occasions. and. Uh, I don't think there's any question on the first occasion that uh, I could have could have uh, been elected, uh, and uh, I just thought about it and thought about it and said, asked myself, do I really want to to be an appellate judge uh, and and such and. I had enough question about it that I didn't, I just made myself available and I didn't uh, uh, encourage anybody to campaign for me or whatever. And uh, I lost by one vote uh, in both houses. Uh, and, uh, or oh, what would have been one vote? Uh, and when it uh, came to the creation of the Court of Appeals, uh, I didn't really pursue that at all. Uh, and I got a telephone call and told me I had to take it, that if I didn't, uh, that they were going to have to uh, elect somebody that they didn't desire. Uh, and uh, I'm not trying to be a crusader by saying that. It's 
as I said, it was very difficult to answer that question. But but I I just didn't like the work of the Court of Appeals. I liked the trial court a, a, a lot better, where I sat there and you like look the witnesses in the in the eye and and uh, uh, you get a you're influenced by the, that personal uh, exposure uh, a lot more than you are by reading what they say uh, in, in a transcript. And uh, I think that's a part of it that uh, uh, I felt influenced by. And uh, I, I just... Uh, uh, I retired at the, about the earliest I could, and uh, uh, I don't regret it. When was that? Uh, when was that? I retired in 1989. So. Uh, After you retired, and you're looking back over your years of of being a judge, whether it's on the circuit or whether it's on the Court of Appeals, what would you like to be most remembered for as a judge? Well, for basic fairness. And I'd like to think that and, uh, enough intelligence and knowledge of the law uh, to have applied that fairly to the questions at hand and, and to have seen that the questions were answered based on the practical uh, sides of the law. So uh, I, I think that would be my position on that. And do you have any regrets about anything that you didn't do as a judge uh, on either of the courts? No, no, uh, not really. I, I did this uh, when I was sworn in as a judge of uh, the circuit court. I made a commitment uh, uh, to myself that I was going to try to, to uh, uh, rule as I should rule that uh, uh, and that uh, I would uh, uh, do, th do that and give the matters of consideration that they deserve and uh, uh, render my opinion and not let it control me after that. And, uh, and that I was going to uh, live my life uh, after uh, trying the case and uh, not look back and and wish I had done this and that and the other, because if it was something that should have been done, I should have d done it during the uh, course of the trial and not thereafter or, or whatever the case may be. And uh, so I continued on, same friends I had, did the same things I did before, and my uh, objective was to to uh, try to hold myself out as a uh, person that uh, would uh, try to protect. Uh, the rights of of any party who might be in the court uh, in a in a political matter.
Thank you so much. Mm-hmm.